Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the uh, second webinar of the European Machine Vision Association about the EMVA 1288 standard. My name is uh, Bernd Jena, and I am the chair of this uh, standardization group. And the idea of this series of webinars is to explain how you can use this standard to characterize uh, cameras in an objective way uh, for your uh, application. Today, uh, we will discuss basically how we can relate image quality to a small set of parameters. We will learn how, what kind of model is behind that, what kind of measurements need to be done, and what finally are the key parameters which define the quality of an image sensor or a camera. And at the end, you have always the opportunity, of course, to ask uh, questions about uh, what you have heard uh, today. So uh, let's get started with the question we addressed uh, in the first uh, webinar. There we asked the question, what limits actually the quality of uh, the image sensor signal? And we learned basically that there are three effects. One is that each measurement you do gives a slightly different value, and this effect is called temporal noise. Then we have many pixels. Each pixel has a little bit different response and that means we have something like spatial non-uniformities. And finally, there is also a signal without light, uh, which is called a dark signal. And of course, we have to analyze how this dark signal influences image quality. It is obvious, of course, to get an optimal image quality, all these effects, temporal noise, spatial non-uniformities, and also the dark signal should be as low as it is possible. So, how can we now basically describe a camera in the best way, possible way? Here on this slide, you see a black box. And this black box basically means we do not know from outside what is really in the camera. The only thing basically we know, we have an input signal into the camera, which is basically is a stream of photons uh, which meet the pixel. And we have also an output signal, which is basically the digital quay value, which is transferred to the computer and which we use to analyze the images. So actually, we can see that we can handle a camera well, like a system, like according to system theory, which means input-output relation. And the strength of the EMVA 1288 standard actually is that no internal measurements are required. We can completely rely on this input-output relation. So it means photons or light in and digital signal out. So without knowing anything what is going into uh, uh, going on in the camera, so if the box it would be really completely black, we can of course measure the output signal. And uh, here I will going to show you, I have here two symbols which I would like to explain here. We have always the symbol, the crack mu which means that is a mean. And we have a second symbol, which is the sigma, which means the standard deviation. And these both things are of importance because we measure, for instance, a mean signal but we measure also how this signal is fluctuating, for instance, by temporal noise or by inhomogeneities. Uh, the interesting thing is now, if you look on the input, 
also on the input, I have not only marked a mean signal, but also the square of the standard deviation, which is called the variance. And so my, you might ask yourself, why actually do we have uh, actually some uncertainty about the input? Well, and this basically has to be, uh, has, uh, the effect is related that a photon carries actually only uh, a little of energy. You can see that more clearly if you look actually for the first step, what every image sensor or quantum and, uh, uh, image sensor does, namely that in the first step, a photon is absorbed in the, uh, uh, in the pixel and then it's being converted into a charge unit and you, for sake of simplicity, you may simply think this is an electron. And so that means one photon is basically being converted in an uh, electron and this uh, efficiency for that is called the quantum efficiency and this is another crack symbol called mu. So that is actually the first model parameter we have. So with which rate actually are photons converted into electrons. An electron actually is a quite low charge unit. So if you look basically how much charge is in an electron, let me write that down here. This is actually 1.6 10 to the minus 19 uh, uh, Coulomb or you can also put that in 1.6, 10 to the minus 15 ampere seconds. So if you are not familiar with uh, charge units, Coulomb, you probably all know what ampere is, so the unit for, um, for current. And if one electron carries basically uh, 10 to the minus 15 roughly ampere seconds, that means if we have a current of one ampere, that means this is one over 1.6, 10 to the minus 19 um, electrons per second. And that is roughly just uh, to get you an order of magnitude, 10 to the power of 19 electrons per second you have. So, an ampere is actually so uh, quite a number of electrons. If you have, for instance, a wire where you have a current of one ampere, you will see basically 10 to the 19 electrons moving along uh, this wire per second. So what are typical units now for an image sensor? Well, for instance, for this dark current, that means the signal which is generated if there is no light this is in the order of one electron per second for a good image sensor. And that is really, you see, if you would good look what kind of current is this, that it's 10 to the minus 15, 19 amperes. So a really a very, very low current. For a typical, um, if you ask how many electrons are actually typically uh, uh, captured by an image sensor, well, this is about 10,000. That means 10 to the power of four electrons. And now assume that you have something like 100 frames per second image sensor. That means then we have roughly a current which is equivalent to 10 to the power 6 electrons per second. And if you convert that now with this factor here into um, a current, that would be then something uh, like 1.6, 10 to the minus 13 amps, what would be the corresponding current. So very very low numbers. Try to measure this current. This is actually uh, not more than 0.16 femtoamperes. Uh, it's very hard to measure uh, such a, a low current.
The reason why I'm telling you that is, if you have these small numbers here, you are entering basically the nano world. And in the nano world, we have different laws from that what you are used in macroscopic uh, uh, situations. Then we enter actually the realm of quantum physics and many things actually on this level in quantum physics are no longer deterministic, but show some fluctuations. And that is the very reason why basically the photons which are entering already into your image sensor show some fluctuations. And the fluctuations is actually quite simple that the standard deviation, I write that here, the standard deviation is basically out the, the square root out of the number of mean uh, photons or electrons you have. That immediately means, for instance, if we go again to the 10 to the power 4, uh, then the standard deviation is a square root out of that, which means 10 to the power 2. So that means we have a variation of about 100 electrons, around 10,000, which is about 1%. So with a typical image sensor already, we have a noisy input with a noise typically of the order of 1%. So that is the first stage in an image sensor uh, we have, that we have already a noisy input. And in a second step, then we get uh, additional dark noise into the system by the dark current we have, and also by all other components we have in the system. Uh, because we assume here in the 1288 standard uh, linear model, and of course, in this, uh, all the circuits which you add on to amplify the signal, you have other noise sources, but if it's linear, you can put them all at the entrance, and that is what's called the dark noise. That means a Quay value independent dark noise collects all the additional noise sources which are within our sensor. So we have basically what's called a shot noise or a photo noise from the input. And then we have another noise source, uh, or may, uh, we can describe as one term, which is a dark noise. And so we come basically to the second uh, uh, quantity, which is a dark noise um, uh, important parameter. And the third one is, of course, then this gain by which we convert basically then electrons, which we collect in an image sensor into digital numbers. And so this system gain has basically the units dn uh, per electron. And that is what is written down here. So that is the interesting picture we have with this simple, but not oversimplified, that's very important, model of a linear camera with only three parameters, quantum efficiency, dark noise, and system gain. And now the question is, what do we have to measure? Let me first go back again to this uh, relation. It is quite clear we have to apply different uh, uh, photon intensities, basically from the dark up to the saturation, and then just measure this, the response of the system. And that means we have to do two things. The first thing is we have to measure what is the digital value we get as a function of the number of photons we uh, collect uh, during the exposure time in one pixel. And that is what's called the characteristic curve. And the characteristic curve, not surprisingly, let me go back again to this graph, is we have two stages. First, by a factor of eta, the quantum efficiency, the number of photons is converted into a number of electrons. The number of electrons is basically multiplied by the system gain. And therefore, the characteristic curve has a slope, which is a product out of system gain and uh, the uh, quantum efficiency. But a linear relation, and it's convenient, as it's shown here in this equation, to subtract the dark value uh, so that you get a direct pro uh, proportional uh, relation between the photo-induced uh, uh, signal uh, in relation to the number of photons. This is not sufficient because we are, of course, interested in the noise. So actually, can we say, given all the noise sources we have, the noise from the photons, the no dark signal noise, uh, 
can we basically uh, measure then also how the noise propagates through the whole system. And this is actually what the photon transfer curve does. It does a simple relation now between the mean value we have as, uh, and we look basically what is the variance of the signal as a function of the mean value. You may wonder, well, why don't you use here, as I've shown here, the standard deviation? The reason has to do with statistics. You have to add variances and not uh, standard deviations. And this is why you express basically the variance of your signal as a function of the mean value. And again, that is a nice thing. You get a linear relation. Not surprisingly, you have an offset which is basically, of course, a dark noise multiplied by k. This is why you have here k squared times the variance of the dark noise. Since it's a quadratic quantity, you have to multiply it by k squared. And then you have an, an, an additional noise source, which I didn't explain so far, which is the quantization noise. You have an analog signal, and then you, you get integer numbers, and so there is an, another uncertainty of the signal uh, compared to the digital value you get out. And then you have another term which is basically the photo noise which increases where the variance increases linear with k. And this is actually a very interesting point and here is somehow the magic of the 1288 standard or of this photon transfer curve because um, noise is finally good for something. If you measure the input noise and the output noise, or the input noise you know actually by this law I explained here. Uh, you can determine something inside the camera without doing measurements directly in the camera, namely you can measure uh, basically this slope which is just the system gain. So the relation between the variance and the uh, mean uh, signal is just the system gain. And that means, since uh, we have, can measure also out of the photon transfer curve the dark noise level, and since we have in the characteristic curve the slope which is uh, k times the quantum efficiency, we can also measure the quantum efficiency. And with this, all these three unknown parameters we have learned here can be measured without doing any measurements in the camera just by this input to output relation. And let me show you two examples. Here is an example of a CMOS sensor which nicely show how linear the relation can be between uh, the irradiation, that means the photons per pixel, uh, and the, uh, the quay value where you subtract always a dark value, and also the photon transfer curve uh, shows a very nice uh, relation uh, that the variance is really linearly increasing uh, with the mean quay value and you can hardly see actually the offset because it's again um, uh, subtracted, it's typically so small, so in all these graphs you find actually the value uh, of the dark noise uh, level always uh, in this curve which is only about 20 dn, dn in this case, a very very small value. So, um, now you may ask one question. We have to measure this standard deviation or the variance of our output signal. And you may know you can only do a useful estimate of a variance if you do many, many measurements. And now imagine we have many irradiation levels. The standard says at least 50. Here this graph shows actually 200. And then to get a good estimate of the variance, you can go through this, uh, you will find out, well, uh, you need at least 100 to 1000 images per each step to do that. So that's not really a good idea and the standard would really not be practical. Uh, how can you do better? Well, you just have to remind yourself I have not only a single pixel, I have millions of pixels, so I can average over all these millions of pixels. But there is a big problem. There is a variation from pixel to pixel by these non-uniformities. And if you would simply take an average and then measure the variation, 
you would measure both the temporal noise and all of the inhomogeneities, uh, the variance, variation of the inhomogeneity. So, no good idea. Fortunately, there is a simple trick. All you have to do is you have to, be rem uh, to think or take into account that the spatial non-uniformities are stationary. So, if I take two images, these two images, each pixel shows uh, basically the same offset, and only what is varying uh, for, that, for a specific pixel is only the temporal noise. So, all what you have to do is subtract basically uh, two images, and uh, then you can calculate the variance as it's shown in the lower figure here. You take your pixel from the first image A, subtract the image B, you don't need to subtract any mean value because the mean is the same in both, square it and add overall pixels. That is how with only two images you can basically measure then uh, the variance. And then the standard again is very nice to apply. Uh, you have only to take hundreds of images and not ten thousands of images to measure basically the photon transfer curve and also the characteristic curve. So let's quickly come also to the non-uniformities. The non-uniformities you have basically two types. One is that if there is no light, each pixel will already have a different dark value. That's called the dark signal non-uniformity. And then, remember, we have uh, assumed now a linear model. And if you have a linear model, we need only another class, which means how does the sensitivity of each pixel uh, change uh, with the position. And that's called the photoresponse non-uniformity. So with the linear model, these two quantities, the dark signal non-uniformity and the photoresponse non-uniformity, uh, is the only thing you have uh, to consider. So then you could say, well, it's very easy. All I have to do is remember again mean values and all the standard deviation. All we have to calculate is the spatial variation of the DSNU and the PRNU. Well, that is not the whole story, unfortunately, because the spatial variation is not purely random. That is actually what we have is the temporal noise. With non-uniformities, we may have purely random variations, but we may have also low-frequency spatial drifts, which are related to the production of the sensor, so that towards the edge is a little bit changing, for instance. We have also really bad things that we may have patterns uh, in uh, the sensor which are very sensible uh, for any type of image processing and also for if the, uh, you as a human observer you can immediately see patterns. And then we have also the bad guys um, that means some outliers that might be single or even cluster of sensor elements or pixels that show a deviation which is outside of any statistical distribution. So that means we need a whole set of tools to analyze all this thing. And you might now think, oh my god, now it really gets very complicated. But fortunately, there is a very intuitive approach and these are a special set of horizontal and vertical profiles. So in, within the standardization group we have uh, found out that this is a very versatile uh, tool where we can see all kinds of uniformities just from four types of profiles. The first what you could do is just take a row or a column in the middle of the sensor and look basically how the whole thing is changing uh, with the position. Then you would see pixel by pixel variation, you would see uh, 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 gradual changes, uh, that, uh, but of course, what you won't see are outliers. Uh, if in this row, for instance, there is no outlier. And also what you also cannot see is, are these pixel-to-pixel -pixel variations purely random, so that in the next row it's completely different? Well, this is easy to decide. Take just the mean of all rows or columns. Then, if you have a pure pixel-to-pixel -pixel variation in all directions, the pixel-to-pixel -pixel variation should be gone. 
But if it's, for instance, a column or um, a row type of uh, variation, then they will still remain. So that's a very powerful uh, tool for this type of things. And then the question is what to do about the outliers. Well, with the outliers, you have uh, to take the following. The outlier is always something which has either a maximum value or a minimum value. So, for instance, take in each column, search for the maximum and for the minimum, and then draw a profile of the maximum and minimum values. And that are the other two uh, profiles which are shown. Let me show you that for a DSNU, the green line you see there is the middle row with all the pixel-to-pixel -pixel variations. The black one is actually the mean. So you see, basically, obviously, these sensors is uh, on the one hand very flat. So you see almost no variation along the profile. And also, obviously, it's simply pixel-to-pixel -pixel variation because it's averaged away. The interesting story here comes really in the maximum, because in the maximum you have many outliers with quite large values, and this is a typical thing observed in modern CMOS sensors that you have a large number of uh, basically so-called hot pixels, which show a much higher dark current than the average. So you can nicely see these things. I said there are a lot of them, but if you count them, that is uh, for out of a million, it may be 100 or even less. Uh, you can see a, a clear asymmetry in the dark. You don't see that. You only see the blue line is a minimum. It's only shifted because of of all the variations you have, you, sh you get now, of course, always the minimum value, but you don't see these, uh, these uh, outliers uh, going down. So nicely an analysis of, of these things. If you now do the same thing for the peer in you, you see again the same type of story, pixel to pixel variation. Uh, if you average over all rows, it's very much flat, but now you have no more hot pixels because you could not have a pixel with suddenly a much more better sensitivity. You see the other thing, you might have several pixels which are, show some defects and are much less sensitive than the other one. So now you see in the minimum curve out, uh, individual outliers. So very nice to uh, rate really how your sensor is, uh, is behaving. So now let's come uh, to the question. We have now this three parameters which define the camera quality, which is the quantum efficiency, uh, the dark noise, and the system gain. And can we now calculate basically this critical parameter, which is called the signal to noise ratio? Because what defines the quality is not how large our signal is, but how large the noise is compared to the mean signal. And this is what's called the signal to noise ratio. For instance, if this value is 100, it means that you have a 100 times larger uh, signal than the noise. By the way, a human eye can only see fluctuations if the signal to noise ratio is smaller than 50. So anything else would be seen without any noise. So we can compute now from this linear camera model. We just have to take these two equations. And then, not surprisingly, we find out that the uh, SNR does not depend on the system gain. Because you can easily imagine, if I amplify everything by a factor of two, I amplify the noise and I amplify the signal. And so the signal to noise ratio should be the very same thing. And that is exactly what you see. You can only see that the signal-to-noise ratio depends only on two factors. This is proportional, basically, to the quantum efficiency. And it's, uh, the dark noise is uh, uh, contained uh, also in there uh, under the square root. The nice thing now with this thing is you can immediately say what would be an ideal camera and compare your real-world camera with an ideal camera. Because an ideal camera, well, how can you define that in, this, in the framework of this linear model? It has a quantum efficiency of 1 and no dark noise. So you, it's important at that point to realize an ideal camera is not a camera which has a signal-to-noise ratio of infinity, because we cannot avoid the noise associated with the photons. The only thing is what a camera manufacturer can do 
he can try to suppress the dark noise as good as possible. And the best is, of course, no additional dark noise, and every photon is being converted into an electron, and then you would have the ideal uh, signal-to-noise ratio is, is just the square root out of uh, the number of, uh, of the photons. So, and this is typically drawn in a double logarithmic plot. The reason is twofold. One is we might have, as you have seen here from our things, as I said, typically we have at least 10 to the power 4 electrons or photons. And we also want to see how the system behaves, let's say, if only one photon is coming in, and to show that the only way is to use a logarithmic scale. Then on the uh, other side, you also plot the SNR as a, um, a, in a logarithmic scale, and then you will see this square root log we had here of an ideal camera, which is uh, the signal-to-noise ratio is the square root out of uh, the mean number of photons that would be a nonlinear curve in a linear graph, but in a logarithmic graph, it's a line with a slope of one half, a straight line with a slope of one half. The real camera is below that, so it has lower signal to noise ratio. And in the bright part, that is because of the quantum efficiency. And you see it's first going parallel to the ideal curve, and then once the dark the effect of the dark noise comes in, it is going to a line which is then proportional, so that means has a slope of 1. And uh, out of this signal-to-noise ratio, uh, we have all the key parameters basically uh, in there. There is one important additional one which I have not considered so far. That means we cannot, an uh, image sensor cannot collect an infinite number of, of uh, electrons. So there is a saturation level. And this saturation level, of course, defines, as you can easily see from these graphs again, the maximum signal to noise ratio you can, you can get. So this is uh, the standard deviation of the temporal dark noise. Uh, the quantum efficiency and also the saturation capacity are the key parameters uh, which uh, de define how much noise you have finally in your image. Um, out of that, you can uh, define a number of three other useful parameters. One is the absolute sensitivity threshold, where the signal-to-noise ratio is 1. Um, and this can be, again, directly computed, as I have shown here. So this is taken uh, as a value where basically the signal is edge large as a noise. And this is actually what you can also see in this graph here. This is this, uh, uh, on the left side, this dashed line, which uh, is a signal to noise ratio of 1, and which is in this graph at about 10 photons. We will have edge much noise as a signal, and the saturation level is uh, at, a, at another value. And out of the ratio of these two things, that means the absolute sensitivity threshold and the maximum signal-to-noise ratio, we can also define the dynamic range. That means basically the whole range from the absolute sensitivity threshold basically to the saturation range. So one curve which shows you all these important things. Except, of course, for the non-uniformities. And the interesting question now is, is there any way that we can include also the non-uniformities? And the good news is, yes, it is possible. Because in the signal-to-noise ratio, in this term, basically, within the square root, we have added all type of variances. So we can simply add the additional, now, spatial variances, which are caused by the DSNU and by the PRNU. So the DSNU, is basically nothing else than another constant term. So it adds basically uh, also to the dark, uh, 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 as, as a dark noise. The PRNU is something special because we have to add variances, and the PRNU is a percentage. Uh, if we have to square it, our noise is actually PRNU squared times the signal squared. And now you see we have an additional term here that. Uh, the photon or shot noise is only going linearly with the signal in the square root, and the other one is the square in, within, in, within the square root. And that clearly means that the PRNU 
sets really an upper limit for this total SNR, as it's called now, gives a new branch in the SNR curve, limiting it to a maximum possible value. Uh, if you neglect everything except the PRNU, you will have that the total SNR, the limiting value of the total SNR is just one over the PRNU. And this is uh, what you find in any data sheet. You have an additional dashed curve. So actually the solid line you see, uh, or the crosses are of course the data points. The solid line is the SNR, the theoretical SNR, calculated simply out of the dark noise and the quantum efficiency. And the dashed line we have added uh, uh, also the uh, DSNU and the PRNU. And for instance, with this sensor, you can immediately say, oh, there is obviously not a single effect by the DSNU. So the DSNU obviously is very low compared to the dark noise in this sensor because the dashed line and the solid line, you cannot distinguish them. Whereas if you go to higher values, you see that this dashed line uh, is not increasing as steeply. There is a, quite a deviation. And this is the effect of the peer in you. So with this total SNR, you can nicely compare for different intensity levels you have in your sensor, what is the influence basically of the inhomogeneities and what is the influence of the temporal noise. Everything basically in here in this thing. Let me just say a few words uh, because time is already running. Uh, about the dark current or the dark signal, which is not constant, but since all of this dark thing is like a current, which means it adds electrons per second, it's simply linearly increasing with the exposure time. And this value is called the dark, this proportionality is called the dark current, which is, has units electrons per pixel and per second. The practical relevance is the following. The dark current limits the maximum usable exposure time because if you expose for a long time, then simply the dark signal uh, saturates already the image. The dark noise also increases, the dark current, sorry, also increases the dark noise because it's also associated with variance. Uh, so we will also have for longer exposure time, we will have more dark noise. Very important to consider if you have an application which needs long exposure times. And then finally, if you a work in varying temperature, so outdoors, in a car, or survival in systems, the dark noise strongly increases with the temperature. That's basically the only parameter uh, in a camera which really strongly depends on the temperature. It doubles every 7 to 10 degrees centigrade. Uh, and uh, so, especially if you have to work with cameras in hot environments, this can cause a lot of headache that the dark current is really getting a problem uh, in, in this situation. So uh, <clears throat> here I've just two examples. Assume for instance that the dark noise is uh, two electrons, the saturation capacity is 10,000, and we have a dark current of 10 electrons per second. Then you can immediately say, well, the dark noise obviously doubles at an exposure time of 0.2 seconds, because then I have an additional two, um, uh, two electrons uh, of uh, uh, things. And the variance is, of course, the same as, the, uh, uh, as, as, a, as, as a mean value. And we can also say, if we have 10 electrons per second and our saturation capacity is 10,000, if we basically have 10 seconds of exposure, we will reach 1% saturation. Well, take 10,000 seconds and then you will saturate your image. So that is how you can handle uh, these parameters. So here's just an example which shows you, for instance, that uh, we have measured here a color uh, camera. So the different color pixels, uh, of course, should show all the same dark current because they are not illuminated. And here you see an example, for instance, of 46 electrons per second. And uh, you can see that the, the, the dark value is really be increasing for these exposure times shown here in this graph. Well, this ends our uh, second webinar, at least what I uh, am uh, talking about uh, today. Now is your turn. If you have any questions, please don't uh, hesitate uh, to state them now. Um, 
Well, I know first question is always the most difficult one, uh, so let's wait a moment um, and um, see whether there are some questions uh, posed uh, to what I try to explain today. Well, obviously, this seems not to be the case. Uh, one reason would be everything was clear, that would be perfect. Uh, or you are simply, I have already 10 minutes overtime, so uh, uh, that this might be the other reason. Uh, but uh, you still have the opportunity, of course, you can simply send me an email, or you can use the opportunity, if you have any questions, to meet me in person, uh, because uh, at the Vision Fair in Stuttgart, which is now from the 6th to the 8th of November, there will be the International Machine Vision Standard booth where all the standards uh, are being presented, also the EMVA 1288, and I will be present most of the three days at this booth. So use the opportunity to get some more information about the 1288 standard. Other sources you can take is I have shown you here uh, two links where you can download documents or data sheets. Um, you will uh, later on, once, once the recorded webinar is, uh, is available, you will of course also get the slides so that you can simply then take these links uh, to uh, go to, the, uh, to these internet places. And for those of you who not only want to use a standard to select the camera, but really want to do all the measurements or are in the development of cameras, there is a special, will be special hands-on seminars where you learn everything, how to do this EMVA 12 measurements in the best possible way, how if something goes wrong or you understand you have deviations from the ideal behavior, you will learn how to interpret them and learn what is wrong with the sensor. And I do, the EMVA does this in uh, basically in cooperation with two companies. One is Framos uh, in Munich. Uh, this will be in December and uh, the second course uh, will be then in March next year at Aeon here in Hanau. Uh, and so you have also the opportunity uh, to really get hands-on with practical exercises. We will do also direct measurements with cameras during this two days uh, seminar. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, webinar. And um, um, uh, please, uh, the, uh, if you are interested, we will have two more webinars next week on Monday and on Tuesday, where we go really now to the practical questions. Uh, well, the first will be you have to learn as much as possible about your application to address the correct questions to these data sheets of the 1288, so that you really know under which conditions do I have to take care of which parameters and which parameters are the most important thing. That would be one webinar and the other webinar would be then really taking uh, typical applications and ask them the question uh, what kind of uh, uh, camera I can choose uh, for this type of application. So thank you very much for your uh, attendance. And I look forward uh, for your attendance then on the uh, third and fourth uh, webinar next week.